Spaceship Junkyard Chapter 3 By an incredible coincidence, the shuttle we took refuge in from the guard drones turned out to be the place we were all looking for, Brian said, examining the control console. Matthew and Chloe felt a mixture of excitement and tension. Okay, great, we found it, what's next? Chloe looked a little worried, her eyes wandering restlessly around the dark corners of the shuttle. What does this signal give us? It gives us nothing, it's just a decoy, a normal beacon. Brian replied with a concentrated look, lost in thought. We need to look further. What do you mean? Matthew leaned over to Brian and tried to look into his clipboard. Just give me ten minutes, have a look around first, Brian sat down in the co-pilot's seat and stared at his clipboard, his fingers sliding quickly across the screen. Matt and Chloe began to study the shuttle in a quieter environment, their eyes gliding over the faded walls covered in layers of old paint, once bright white but now an ivory shade. Dusty cobwebs hovered in the corners, giving the impression of an abandoned castle, hidden from the eyes of the world for years. The light from their torches cast bizarre shadows on the floor, which was covered with worn metal plates. The interior paneling of the passenger compartment seemed particularly interesting, it combined utilitarian design elements with unexpected ornamentation, reminding them that this shuttle was not just for transporting passengers, but also a symbol of the space age. Every knob, hatch and control panel bore the marks of the many hands that had touched it. This small ship carried passengers and cargo from Mars orbit to the planet's surface. It had three decks, two for passengers and a lower cargo deck. Cobwebs hung from the corners of the ceiling, and there were nests of small birds that had taken refuge here. The atmosphere was eerie and oppressive. I don't feel comfortable here, let's go back to Brian's, Chloe asked. Agreed, Matt replied briefly, and they headed for the captain's bridge. Brian was working on some sort of control panel that had been set up in front of the navigator's chair. Did you find anything else? Matt inquired. All this time I've been searching the net for information on the construction of these shuttles, and I finally got the information I needed, Brian replied. You're not going to share it with us? Chloe asked. Well, anyway, when I realized that this signal wasn't going to give us any information other than the location of the ship itself, I decided to find out where the black boxes were. The ones that record the entire history of the ship. Well, shuttles of this series were factory fitted with three such modules. Two of them are installed in the engine compartments, and we cannot get to them without a good set of tools, and the third module is installed in this panel. We'll take it off and take it with us, I'll check the contents at home, go through all the files and maybe we'll find something interesting, Brian finally removed the memory module and put it in his rucksack. He also took some pictures and stored the geolocation. We should get going, we can head back. Chloe was visibly pleased with the result. The boys took the opposite route, walking quickly and carefully, not lingering anywhere and checking for guard drones all the time. It took them about two hours to get back to where they had left the bike, and only then did they feel like they were going to fall off their feet, so tired were they. On the way home they were stopped by a police patrol. They started to feel nervous, but when the policeman approached them, the tension eased. He turned out to be Uncle Matthew, the sheriff of the town. Hello, nephew. He said hello. Hey, hey, we're on our way home, we've been out all day. Matt said hello. Guys, this is my uncle Robert, my mum's younger brother. Robert, this is Chloe and her little brother Brian. They shook hands. So you've been outdoors, is that why your head is covered with cobwebs? When you walk in the woods, you have to take a branch and clear the cobwebs out of your way. Robert liked to admonish in a jocular and humorous way. In general, he was a very funny man. Oh look, there's a spider on your shoulder. Matthew fumed. Just kidding, just kidding. Drive on. Robert laughed and gave Matthew a friendly pat on the shoulder. It was nice to meet you. Tell your mom I'll drop by sometime. Once home, the boys had dinner with their parents and went straight to bed. 
The emotions and new discoveries accumulated during the day gave way to physical fatigue, and their eyes closed on their own. So no one had to toss and turn, everyone fell asleep within a few minutes. Sunday came. Brian and Chloe went to church with their parents for the Sunday service. Matt decided to have a chat with his dad. Dad, tell me about the war on Mars. You were a military pilot in a fighter plane, weren't you? asked Matt. Yes, but I graduated from the military academy a month and a half after the war ended and enlisted in peacetime, Matthew's father replied. And then what happened? asked Matt. I served my contract for three years and then went into civil aviation, which is where we met your mom, his father replied, immersed in happy memories of those bygone days. A smile was on his lips. Yes, yes, I remember that, you've told me about it before, Matt eagerly led his father to the main question. What I'm interested in is this. How did our troops destroy that ship? And what kind of ship was it? It's just that we haven't studied the subject in history yet. It was a large alien ship. Our command constantly tried to make contact in every possible way, but there was no response. So we decided that this ship was unmanned, just programmed that way. It was constantly sending out small combat drones from its dock, which our troops would engage. The ship itself was impossible to approach. He took a sip of tea. Well, well. Go on, Matt was burning with curiosity. Yes, it was impossible to get close to the ship because of the dense drone fire. He'd let them attack or just keep them around. There would be lulls of a few days, the longest being seven, and then it would start all over again. No one knows how many drones he had, but our troops would destroy them by the hundreds in a single battle. But unfortunately our ranks were thinning too, we lost half the fleet, his story was interrupted by his mother coming into the living room. Everett, take Matthew and check the lawn mower, it stopped in the middle of the lawn again and it's not working. That's the third time in two weeks, I think I'll have to buy a new one, she politely asked the men to get on with their immediate chores. Her father jumped up from the sofa, stood in formation, saluted and reported with a broad smile, Will do, my dear Susan. Matt, get up, we have work to do. Susan laughed happily, go on, I'll set the table soon, we'll have lunch. There was a large tree in the backyard of their property that provided plenty of shade to hide from the hot sun. Everett didn't even go near the lawn mower, and when his son looked at him questioningly, he replied, I don't want to bother, we'll get a new one. This one's too old, there's no point in fixing it. The father sat down on the chain swing under the tree. Matt ran into the house and brought drinks. Well, our troops lost about half the fleet, it wasn't clear what to do next. We couldn't communicate, we couldn't understand their intentions, we were at a dead end. The situation changed when ours captured a drone with damaged cannons, and it was not dangerous. Our programmers managed to hack into the drone's alien detection system. Ours then installed these programs on two of our shuttles, which the ship now recognized as their drones. We placed a nuke in the cargo bay of one of the shuttles and headed for their ship's dock. The plan was to leave the ship with the explosives and return in a second shuttle, but something went wrong, two pilots were killed in the explosion, the second shuttle escaped with only one person on board, can't remember exactly who, his father looked around the house, Susan was standing at the window gesturing to the dinner table. Matthew had almost put the whole puzzle together in his mind. The thought that they had found the very ship that had managed to survive was stirring his brain. He couldn't think of anything else to do, he had to share this new information with his friends right away. Son, let's go to lunch, Mum's calling the table, Everett snapped at Matthew. Yes, yes, let's go. Matt replied confusedly, trying not to forget anything. After lunch with his parents, Matt asked his father about his pickup truck. What do you need it for? Everett asked. To take our old lawnmower to Brian, maybe he'll take it apart and he can use some parts from it, Matt was getting impatient to tell the boys the story he had learned from his dad. Is that your mate Chloe's little brother? That's a cute girl. How is she by the way? 
Are you and her serious? Susan inquired. Mum, not now. Matt replied, reluctantly showing his affection for Chloe. What's the big deal? I'm just curious. I'm your mum. Susan asked with a smile. Everett realized there was an urgent need to get his son out of trouble. Sure, you can have my truck. Come on, I'll help you load the lawn mower, he put his hand on his son's shoulder and they walked out of the dining room. Thanks, Dad. She wouldn't leave me alone. Matt hugged his father. Just take her out to dinner sometime, let them get to know each other, Mum would really like that. Everett suggested. That's a good one. Matt replied as he got behind the wheel of the pickup truck. When he arrived at Chloe's house, Matt found the gate to the garage open, so he parked in the driveway and went straight into Brian's garage. He was sitting at his computer, wide-eyed and a little confused. What have you got here? Matt asked. An incredible amount of data. I've been sitting here for an hour and a half now and I don't know where to start, I have no idea. So many files, Brian replied. I see, where is Chloe? I have very important information about this ship. Get her quickly. Matt was already ready to tell her. Chloe came down to the garage, they sat down on the sofa and Matt began to tell in great detail what he had learned from his father today. After listening attentively to the end of Matthew's story, the boys looked at each other in surprise. You mean to tell me that we found this ship by accident? Chloe couldn't believe what she had just said. I suppose it could be. Matt replied. I've got an idea. Brian sat down at his computer and started looking something up on the net. I need to know the date and time the alien ship exploded, then we'll filter the files in the memory module by date and time and keep looking. I have a feeling this is exactly what I've been missing. Here, look. Matt shouted. The year 2086, September 12, 1407. Put a filter on the file search. There's these, look, two video files, date added one minute before the explosion. Brian opened the first file, but the computer gave an error that the file was corrupt and could not be opened. The same thing happened with the second file. Seeing the error message, Chloe and Matt's faces reflected disappointment. Chloe pressed her lips into a thin line, her eyes sparkling with both disbelief and hope. Is it all for nothing? Flashed through her mind. Matt, sitting next to her, rubbed his hands over his face as if to wipe away the tiredness and disappointment. We were so close, he whispered, his voice hoarse with excitement and exhaustion. His gaze wandered, reflecting a mixture of determination and worry. Brian leaned over the keyboard despite his fatigue, his fingers scrolling rapidly through the commands. The screen flashed with windows and pop-up messages, reflecting the complex process of searching and analyzing the data. The system is showing file structure corruption, he explained as he scanned the error logs. It could be due to old media or external influences. I'll try to run a recovery through the decompression algorithm, his voice sounded focused, but there was a hint of excitement in it. A line of code appeared on the screen and Brian began to enter a complex sequence of commands. He activated the recovery program, which began to slowly work its way through every byte of the corrupted files, trying to recreate their original appearance. Okay, I think I can do it, but I'm going to need more time, I need to be patient, Brian sat slumped in front of the computer. The boys decided to go home as tomorrow was the start of the school week and they needed to get ready for lessons.